Welcome to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and today we're going to be talking about why nurses should be political. And I'm joined by Dr. Allison Hernandez. Welcome, Allison. Thank you for having me. And you've been on the podcast before, so welcome back. And maybe just give people an update of kind of who you are, what you're doing, and then we'll dive into why nurses should be political. Absolutely. I am very much like you, Melissa. I was a health and aging policy fellow. I think the last time we we talked, well, you weren't a fellow then, but I was. So that was last year, 2020. And since I've taken a bit of a career pivot since my fellowship and decided to stay on the Hill, as they say, and become a legislative assistant for a member of Congress. And I cover their health care portfolio. I also cover a lot of other issues, as is common in the House, the U.S. House of Representatives, when you're in a staff position, but I mostly focus on health care and on moving the members of Congress agenda in the healthcare space forward. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I love to see nurses doing health policy work. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, kind of why nurses, I mean, that's the first question, why should nurses even be political or care? Right. So, I mean, I think just that baseline, I always like to say that nurses are innately health policy experts just by the nature of their training, education, and practice in delivering health care. We are at the front line, right? The 4 million plus nurses in our country are at the front line delivering health care. And that lived experience and those skills combined make us great health policy experts because we get to see what ticks, right? What contributes to healthcare? What keeps bringing people back to a hospital or a clinic? What are the issues that patients and families talk about? And I think what's really also powerful about our profession is that we're very ubiquitous. We're, we're very versatile. Our skills go everywhere, right? If we work at, in a, like I said, clinic or hospital or in a school, I mean, we can be in education. We really are everywhere. Uh, with, but with that sometimes comes sort of a, a, a lack of general understanding from the public as to you know, what What are nurses' role in, in politics and policy, right? Because everyone loves the idea of a nurse, you know, members of Congress, <laughs> to, to our family members, they all applaud and, and think nurses are great. But I, I think the lack of self-awareness within the nursing profession that we are health policy experts because of the skills we possess is still lacking. So sort of a, a combination of education and empowerment. And when I talk about skills, I'm thinking of things like, our critical thinking, our ability to triage and communicate really efficiently with other members of our team, the fact that we look at patient care holistically, as opposed to just like one body part at a time, we're also just great at, at, at team playing. And, and, and all of these things together make us not only, not only gives us the power and knowledge to be health policy influencers and have an important message, but also to translate those skills and use them when we communicate or try to be influencers of policy. Right. I think that, you know, this is certainly a role that most people don't think that nurses, you know, would have. And this work tends to be, you know, on the side. It's not like our our full-time work. Yeah. And I think about the different places where you can have an impact. Sometimes it's within your own hospital or nursing home or within your community and at the state level and at the federal level. So why do you think nurses aren't as involved in policy today? Right. And and I'll backtrack a little. You said something that kind of spring my memory or jog my memory a little bit is that we are also natural advocates, right? Mm -hmm. From the, again, our training and our experience, we're constantly advocating either for the single patient or a group of patients or families. And so that, that in itself is a really important skill to have when you're trying to get a member of Congress to pay attention to an issue. Uh, we're also educators. We understand how to like talk to people in a certain way that they understand. And, and we also focus, we're focused on building rapport, right? So leading with empathy and understanding and an open mind. Um, and, and those, again, are all things that are, are really important skills to have when, when communicating and trying to connect with members of Congress. I think what's missing, I, I kind of touched on this before, is the u- sort of ubiquity-ness, <laughs> if that's a word, of, of nurses being everywhere, right? So I feel a lot of times, um, and this is my personal opinion, 
that a lot of the nurses we see in policy are very developed in their careers or, or, or not that they're later, but perhaps they're in already in leadership positions. So it becomes very top down approach, right? It's like, I'm in a position of uh, power and leadership, and now I, I want to, I'm interested in, in policy and politics, whether it's an internal thing at, in their work and their place of work or, or on a larger scale like state or federal. But I, I truly believe we have to start thinking of just like the bottom up approach of like all nurses having to have a say in policy making. The number one thing that I've learned being in Congress working as a staffer is who you elect matters. And it sounds cliche, but it is so important. And specifically, you know, getting out to vote, being uh, engaged civically with uh, local, state and federal elections is really important. If you want to see change, you have to put people in power that resemble your ideologies in some way. You know, no one's perfect. No politician is perfect. But it, it is really important to have a majority of people in Congress representing the what would be the majority of people electing them. Right. So I think that's just number one. Number two is, Melissa, you touched on it, is I think practicing taking leadership positions, maybe starting at you know, a level like your community or workplace. I always tell this anecdote when I was a staff nurse, you know, we used to have small like working groups and coalitions on our floor that would then kind of connect on an issue. So let's say fall risk, and then they would be invited to connect with the hospital CEO and CNO and be at the table, you know, communicating issues and changes they would want to see in practice and policies. And I kind of always rolled my eyes at that. I was like, I'm already tired. <laughs> I don't want to stay longer at work or come in on my day off. And now I see the true power in that, that at least those nurses were getting to have conversations with people in leadership and they were exercising not only their you know rights as an employee, but also they were collectively trying to highlight the things that really mattered and advocate. So I think that's a perfect example of where nurses can start practicing. That can happen in a community too. I mean, I even think like, being part of your, if you live in a building or in your neighborhood, being part of like the board that <laughs> runs your, your neighborhood watch or whatever, um, all those things are really important. And nurses, you know, aside from health, just public policy in general, right? It's not just about something medical, but, you know, social justice issues and, and climate change. I mean, whatever it is we care about, we can we can advocate for. So those would be my, my first two ones. And the other two would be that, you know, professional nursing or other organizations that have, you know, sort of a constituency or lobby on the Hill, or whether again, it's the Hill locally at a state level or federal, I think it's really important to, to, to connect with those organizations, be an active member, participate in their meetings. They're great learning platforms, but also often organize Hill days and easy ways to communicate with members of Congress. So it's a nice way to dip your toe and and do it and then like get in, in the wave of like, okay, this is what it looks like in action when I do a Hill day or if I write a message to a member of Congress. And then really importantly, you know, you're in education, Melissa, and I think entrenching health policy in nursing education at every level is really important. And very importantly, uh, health economics. Uh, so the role that healthcare plays in our economy, I mean, so we know that healthcare is uh, 17, almost 18% of our gross domestic national product. We're making a lot of money. Healthcare is a business. And as providers of that services, we as nurses really need to have a at least cursory understanding because without that, we can't really be effective influencers of policy. When you're talking to members of Congress, the Congress is the power of the purse. We legislate on how we spend the money we're, we're bringing in. And so if, if we can connect the dots between healthcare, healthcare goods, healthcare, healthcare services, and uh, economics, then we're going to be sort of missing the point in terms of how and what and why to talk to members of Congress about. So that was a lot of information. And I'll <laughs> sure. say kind of what I think kind of the main points were is, you know, that when we think, when we talk about nurses being political, what we're really talking about is being an advocate and being an advocate is different than being a lobbyist. And I think lobbyists kind of get you know, the bad name versus if you're an advocate, it's just like when you advocate the bedside, if you're telling a story, 
from the bedside or from your professional experience to a policy maker of any sort. So it's basically who's in charge. <laughs> when you share that story, then you know it gives them a way to say, okay, so here's a problem. How might what policy might need to change in order to fix that problem, you know, at whatever level it is. So I think probably that's first is shifting that mindset that you can be political just by being an advocate. Right. And and then to think through all the different ways that that can play out, right? So I think sometimes when we say nurses should be political or should be involved in policy, people think that means going to you know Capitol Hill by yourself at the federal <laughs> level for something. And that's a really scary thing to think about doing. And what you have shared is that there are ways to do that where you can kind of start small and 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 develop as you develop your skills to go to advocate at a larger level. So it might be just going to your unit manager at first. And then if it's something that you need to go to a state level and it's an issue that you're, that's important to you and and it's in common or in line with your professional organization that they do organize Hill days where you can go as a group. And that's the importance of being involved with your state nurses association. And then ANA does a federal, you know, Hill day. So I do think those are really great ways for people to get started. And then to think through, you know, Could you write an editorial or develop a blog or write an op-ed? So just so that people or that nurses know there are multiple ways that you can get involved. And then definitely making sure you get your mail to the right mailbox. (laughs) Because, you you know, if it's Medicare, when people say it takes an act of Congress to change something in Medicare, that's true. Because Congress dictates what's going to pay for, you know, what's going to be covered. So that's different than like private insurance or so always making sure you that you, you do have to understand the economics of it and who's in charge of influencing that policy. You know, I really like what you said. Sorry to, to interrupt you. I You hammered on something or you brought something up that I think is really important. And um, I'm having like a, a moment now. Nurses are also solution driven, like focused, right? When we're working at whether it's at the bedside or in whatever medium we're in, we're focused on how do we fix this, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and I think that's a really important uh, mindset to have in mind frame when you're practicing these sort of pol- policy political engagements. And that's some a good selling point for our profession is that we're always going to be driven by the solution. And members of Congress love solutions, right? They love when people come and say, "This this is this is a problem, but this is how we fix it." And and I know we're going to do another chat on on sort of how to communicate specifically with members of Congress. But I think that's a really important lesson and something we already possess at, with our training. So I just wanted to, to highlight that because I think it's it's important for us to 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 take the reins of the fact that we are solution focused and driven. Right. And that could even be you, you had mentioned kind of getting in touch with your legislators, either state or the federal level, once you figure out which mailbox you need. But even just that there's power in even just sending an email or making a phone call and kind of leaving your name, your number, where you, you know, your address so that they know you're a constituent and telling that story to say, here's a story of how this played out. Here's the solution for it. And would love for you to create some legislative mechanism to fix that. Um, and that can be done at any level. Like you don't have to have, you know, a PhD in order to do that. I mean, if you if you have RN behind your name, then right. you're a nurse and and you have the power to send an email as a constituent and as a concerned citizen. Right. And and you know, identifying bills as solution. Can you co-sponsor this? Just telling members of Congress what is it that a nurse does? Again, we're we're so ubiquitous. People think they understand what nurses do and the spaces we take up, but uh, I, I'm going to say that they don't. <laughs> um, nurses do right. so many things, and I don't think we're as good as advocating for us as like uh this is who we are because we're kind of we're at the bedside or at the wherever doing the work. And so just even telling people, these are my expertise. This is my story. This is my background. I just had a conversation the other day with a constituent who's a nurse um, who was giving me sort of a landscape of the state um, health care related issues and what they think is, is important. And I can't tell you how helpful that was. Um, as, as a staffer, I'm always looking for, for, for that, those skills, that knowledge. And so it's just a matter of, of, 
you coming to us often because <laughs> the other way around is a little harder. Right. And I think also just serving, being aware of the fact that you could just make that connection, you know, establish a relationship with somebody in your legislator's office. And then when they have, you know, they need to deal with that problem. They're like, Hey, well, I remember I met this, you know, this nurse and this was her area of expertise, you know, and then they can, they can reach out to you, but again, you have to reach out first because when you have to solve a problem, you're like, okay, where do I even begin? And, you know, so you kind of start with Google, (laughs) (laughs) you know, unless they, unless you've made that connection. So that's another powerful way to just kind of say, here's my short bio. If you ever need anything in these areas, you know, I'm here to help you to do that. So so what do you think if someone wanted to to take on more of a leadership role in the health policy arena? What are some recommendations you would have for someone to develop these skills? And and to keep in mind that this is a lifelong journey, mm-hmm. you know, and so what would you recommend for people even to just get started besides checking out our three podcast series and the other, the other ones we might do, but we're going to at least do three. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think what I love about um, your podcast and then a lot of times of the conversations we have is we, again, it's practical information here. It's practical knowledge. We want to apply what we hear (laughs) so um, we can wax poetically about the whys, but it's important to know how we do these things. And so, you know, I kind of touched on a couple important things before is just starting to, you know, fake it till you make it, start volunteering for things. Um, in terms of just your workplace, perhaps, or your own community, um, if there's little boards or, or or just groups that are organizing or coalescing over something that matters to you, I think that's really important. Um, volunteering for campaigns. So, you know, when in a local election, again, it doesn't have to be on a federal level, but state or local is going on. Um, volunteer a little bit of your time. Um, I mean, obviously, if you can contribute to a campaign, if that's within your wherewithal, that's always really important. But when you volunteer on campaigns, you not only get to meet a lot of different people, but you're really getting at the first point I make, which is electing the people that represent you is the most important thing ever. And like the thing that you can, if there's one thing you're going to do after this podcast is that, right? Be a registered voter voter, and stay civically engaged. Um, but to that point, I think staying really on top of the news, and that sounds daunting because we have a 24-hour a day news cycle, but the press is so important when it comes to shaping the political narrative around issues. Um, this doesn't mean you have to read every newspaper cover to cover, but making a habit of, of picking one source or two a day, maybe something local and something national that focuses on an issue that you care about or just healthcare in general, I think is really important. Um, I've made a habit of of listening to, for example, a quick NPR sort of overview of of the news. And now my job is is paying attention to the news. Um, And then I read a Washington Post healthcare, free healthcare newsletter. um, And then I'll skim sort of like the 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 front page of our local state newspapers, but you know you don't have to do all that. But just pick something that resonates with you that you could do on a daily basis, twenty minutes, and you will learn a lot more than you think. Um, and and you will you will start to get an understanding of 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 what where the conversation is and what's the hot the hot topics. Um, I also think that apart from being active with with an advocacy group or an organization that is advocating on the behalf of certain issues that you care about, um, think of yourself as a, you know, as potentially running for office (laughs) one day. Um, There's a lot of nurses doing it at a local and state level um, throughout the country. Um, In Congress right now, um, we have three nurses, uh, Congresswomen. So we have Cori Bush, we have Bernice Johnson, and we also have Lauren Underwood. And they're all, you know, they're all Democrats, but they're all like uh, interestingly spread across the political ideologies. Like Cori Bush is very um, uh, social justice oriented. And then we have Lauren Underwood that is really into um, uh, like fortifying the ACA and, and Bernice Johnson does a lot with social determinants of health and maternal health. So just to give you an idea of, you know, that there are nurses in these roles. And um, if you're interested in doing that, that is a good go- quick Google search. But 
most importantly, making connections in your community, especially if you're working and volunteering on campaigns, um, is a really good way to dip your toe in, in the political sphere of things. Right. And, you know, and I teach health policy you know, at George Washington University in our school of nursing. And the way I typically frame it is you really just need to understand the four P's. So you need to understand the process. Right. You need to understand the policy. So how do we even find you know, bills to even know kind of what's out there? Um, and, and then the third thing is um, the politics. And then the last part is the press. So if you become kind of a scholar of the four P's, I mean, it's not like you, I mean, you can take a class, you can do a formal fellowship, but you can also have an independent study. Just say, you know, this, for this next quarter, I'm going to learn more about the legislative process at either the federal or state level, or here's a, you know, a problem that's important to me. And I think I have a solution. So how do I move it forward? So kind of thinking through the four P's and, you know, with 4 million nurses, we, you know, we all graduate as generalists. That's what a baccalaureate degree prepares you to do. Um, and anyone with an associate degree, you know, we're hoping to do the BSN and 10 based on the future of nursing, you know, report. And by the way, the update just came out. If you haven't read that, that's another good place to start um, is to get the, the most recent version of the future of nursing report. So with the baccalaureate degree, we're all generalists, but then we all go into different practice arenas. And so while I've only ever worked in a nursing home, I can't really be an advocate for somebody who's hospitalized except for like transitions of care, you know, versus your area of expertise. So it does take multiple voices to solve all the different problems, you know, that we have. And so thank you very much for sharing all of your expertise. Any final comments before we close out um, this session? Yeah, I am um, kind of pivoting and or hinging on what you just said. I, I, I kind of almost see it as there's two, two uh, categories of advocating we're doing, I think, at the very core and baseline is we're just advocating for all, our profession and to educating the world on, you know, what the nurse does, where they are and how and, and we do our work. Right. And then at, at the other issue, what you were saying about our expertise, whether you work in long term care or in the ICU, you know, you'll become a subject matter expert in something um, and, and then advocating for that um, and the issues you see in that. But but also, you know, I would add to that is that this kind of some career advice I got recently when you work and I mean, it's different when you're in clinical practice because you're solving a lot of problems all the time, but thinking more on, on how you organize your advocacy mind and what are the issues you're going to hammer on long term is to pick two things which could or could not be related to your work, but pick two things that really matter to you. I think you have to feel really connected to the cause. They might be linked to something economic. There was some financial reason for it, but, but just pick two things and work the lifelong work, as you described, to really hammer those and work on advocating through different venues. And, and, and similar to you, Melissa, to using your voice through social media and, and, and communicating with broader audiences and not siloing ourselves in, in this just the world of nursing. And this is what we do. And we're too busy for everything else. So pick those two things. And that will give you more direction in terms of finding, you know, who does the work, um, where are the solutions, and then how to hammer out um, a change, <laughs> which is what we want, right? So um, those would be my, my parting thoughts for this podcast, but I'm excited to continue the conversation. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you for being with us today, Allison. And, you know, this is getting old, um, has taken your advice, and it's focused primarily around improving the quality of care delivered to older adults in this country, which involves, you know, helping people understand aging, the impact of ageism, and how to create age -friendly, an age-friendly world. But then also um, my my research interest and clinical practice interest has always been around improving care for particularly for older adults with Alzheimer's disease and their family. So um, I do think it is good to have kind of two core um, issues that you're working from. And so thank you for sharing everything. And I will look forward to seeing you again very soon as we continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and if you'd like to learn more, you can check out my other episodes on my YouTube channel by either by subscribing and ringing the bell to get immediate notifications when new content comes out.
In addition, you can also find the audio version of the podcast on Amazon Music, Spotify, iTunes, and Stitcher. Please feel free to leave an honest review because more reviews mean more awareness of the podcast and helps us move towards an age-friendly world. If you have a comment or a question, you can visit my website, melissabphd.com. Go to the Contact Melissa tab and you can leave me a voice message. You never know. It might just include your question or your comment in an upcoming episode.